I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like live right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. And joining us today is Jackie Luke Mon in the building. Yeah. <laughs> you like Revolutionary that? greetings, all Africans of different shades and persuasions and proclivities. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. What's going like on that. this morning, Jared? I can't call it, Jackie. How are you doing today? How are you? I'm doing okay. Another day. Happy for that. Right on, right on. Um, well, I just want to let everybody know off the top that that um uh I have I, I think I mentioned the other day that I have a new favorite white host media outlet uh-huh. and it's it's you'll see clips I'm, I'm sure i'll get the clips of them over you know as we go forward uh it's rm brown a comedian a communist comedian out of austin texas uh who whose show i've become a big fan of i haven't laughed so hard at making fun at uh the mainstream and the so-called alternative media space in a long time uh and he uses sound effects drops similar to what i used to do in back when i used to do radio Mm. and mixtapes but uh so if you hear some of them today uh i did download an app because i've been so inspired i want to do some of the same thing so i'm biting off of him i'm letting everybody know Mm. jump i'm biting off of him and i just want to you know shout him out as i do that uh, even even if it was something that I once upon a time did do anyway, but anyway. Okay, okay. Just, so just so we're not talking iteration. about we're not talking about R M Brown LLC, are we here? Because what I'm I'm, I'm no, looking him what up. Is that? No, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm no Googling on YouTube. Him. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I got no, no, no. it. Let me. Okay, okay. I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what I don't know what was coming up. Uh, whatever you were looking at, but uh, uh, as I said, he is. Uh, I, you know, I, I just, I just think he's funny. I just think he's very funny. His show is very well done. You can tell he's got comedic, a comedic background. This is his page here, just so we're clear. Um, and uh, uh, I have, I would encourage people to check it out. Um, it's hilarious. And I've learned a lot about the, the alternative white media spaces that I don't pay much attention to. Uh, and, and I get, I I can see why I just get it. I get why we are where we are. That's all. Mm. I get it. Um, Oh, no, no. Come on. You gonna have to elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I mean, it's just that it's a, you know, from, because he, he, he targets people like that is Brown targets people like, um, uh, Jimmy Dore, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, Joe Rogan, uh, and, uh, people to their right, like Tim Poole and to the far right, like Steven Crowder and Ben Shapiro, mm-hmm. uh, whose names I have occasionally maybe seen pop up, read in passing, heard in the, you know, maybe even mentioned once or twice by students. Mm -hmm. but I never paid any kind of attention and didn't realize how, how big their platforms are. Um, uh, Even when they're supposedly deplatformed, they're getting hundreds of thousands and millions of views uh, Mm -hmm. in very short periods of time. They're very well funded. And now Ben Shapiro, I didn't even know he launched this daily wire thing and has Candace Owens working with him. (laughs) Uh, So I've learned, uh, you know, so, but I can't tolerate, like I've thought of doing things like what Brown is doing, 
in terms of of uh, watching other people's videos and making fun of their shortcomings. But honestly, I, I just don't have the, the stomach to sit through all of the tape that he does watching these folks. So even yeah. people like I, I thought about once in a while, like I've, I've done it once in a while with Roland Martin and stuff like that. But I really can't I couldn't see watching hours and hours of Roland Martin in the way oh, that he oh. watches hours of these folks. And I would never watch these folks to this extent. So seeing yeah. them distilled in clips with humor uh is enough and I enjoy it. And honestly, I would encourage it for folks who need a good laugh because I mean, he, you know, it's just funny. So, you know, if if you've ever enjoyed like a Seinfeld or any of that kind of stuff. Mm. And and you know, know. yeah, I mean, the thing is, I think those people are because we are, (laughs) you know, on the left, like off the, edge of the world left, you know, in the deepest, darkest of Africa left <laughs> from these people. I mean, the Shapiros and the Owens, yeah, they, they do stuff that, and they say things that that piss us off, but really they don't, I don't see them posing as much of a uh, constant like threat to us where we would be paying a whole lot of attention to what they say because they're not anywhere near where our politics are. I mean, they may no. mention poli- they, you know, they may mention, oh my God, I hate socialism and I hate communism, but you know, we we know we it, that we don't we're not we're not at risk of having uh radical black folks be confused and agree with Candace and Ben and and you know all of these, you know, alt-right right-wing folks whereas on the progressive white left that is kind of a a real issue this whole red brown alliance foolishness um and 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 even the 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 danger of kind of uh sounding like you you you're you're a republican and this is really interesting jared because i was on um i did a segment on uh uh, 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 China, uh, CGTN last night. Mm. Um, and they keep inviting me back. So I, I guess I haven't pissed anybody off that much. So, um, I mean, clearly I'm not on my game, but, um, they had, uh, they were talking about Biden's first year and it was on uh, the show, the heat. Um, and so they had a panel of folks and I can, I usually don't see the other panelists, but I know who they are because they introduced them. And there's always this, they usually have this Republican strategist who is a black guy. And it bothers me that in my critique of Joe Biden, I, I almost find myself agreeing with the Republican strategist. Mm, mm. And, and, it, and it is such an uncomfortable thing, but I think that is as close as we radicals will ever get to being mistaken for Republicans. Sure, like, sure, sure. You know, our, our critique of the Democratic establishment is the critique that comes from the right. It's like, yeah, I, I can't, I can't disagree that they're right about many issues with uh, uh, the Biden administration. That doesn't mean I agree with them entirely, but I think that's as close as we come to like needing to pay yeah, attention no, I didn't, to what these I, folks say. Yeah, I didn't mean like that. That these folks would influence our target audience. But in mm-hmm. terms of creating, but they do impact the people uh, against whom we have to struggle. That's true. Uh, That's true. And and in setting, in, in in other words, I see why so many in white America would be behaving as they do and thinking as they do, if uh, if if the Crowders and the Pools and the the Shapiros and the Owens are getting this many views like if they, i mean they're yeah. getting millions of views they are uh, uh daily i mean he's put, and i didn't even realize i mean they're producing content daily uh that is yeah. getting this much so so they're they you know and, and never mind the alex joneses like i haven't heard from him i don't hear from him well, didn't uh, he get indicted he did he did yeah uh, for the, and he, for the sandy hook he got lie. sued for the sandy hook stuff and but but his platform is still so big in fact uh, Brown was just doing a piece on it the other day, or what I saw the other day, 
and he and he he made that point that that even with all of this deplatforming and and canceling, Alex Jones still had a hundred thousand views on a video that had only been up for like less than a day. So so wow. I mean. Anyway, so and then he still and, and then it was reported that he still uh, uh, made one hundred and sixty five million dollars from his store in the last, I think, three years. It was a, a, a total of. So, I mean, he's he's out here like he he's like the new Rush Limbaugh, you know, like like he's like the the so mm-hmm. so they are. And I never used to watch Limbaugh, but the, so they are creating an atmosphere. That's all I mean that that yeah. and, and I can just see why. You know, you watch five minutes of a clip of these people, and it's like, damn. <laughs> I mean, I like, you almost forget like how like I'm used to being like I, I stopped again, like I stopped at at Jimmy Dore or or this mm-hmm. or now this guy Brown. Like that's as far as I go. But that's just the <laughs> these these folks out here just lunatic. And what I think, yeah. and I think Brown's point is right. A lot of it is just being done for money. I mean, they just there's a lot of money yes. to, in that. There's a lot of money, and as Jor Door has gone more and more like uh, uh, anti vaccination, he's made mm-hmm. more and more money. Like mm-hmm. moving to the right, even Glenn Greenwald is on Fox News all the time. Apparently, he's going on Tucker Carlson all the time and stuff like that. So, like there, there, there's, there's. They would say a bigger, bigger audience or whatever, but there's a lot of money out there for that too. So anyway, but look, I know we only we only are, are fortunate to have you for I think half of the show today. So yeah, I'm so fortunate. let me let you do your thing first and and bring up and get to what what it is you wanted us to get to. Brother Kaba is on his way. Apparently, I did not send him the link again. Uh, that was an accident. Um, sure, it was Jared. Whoops. Four percent shenanigans. Four percent. I got to start cutting people off. I mean, the semester starting up again. I got that four percent cola. I can't be hanging with you all like that too much now. This is, oh my gosh! See, and, and, this and, is... and, and, and speak of the problem, there he is. There he is. Speak of the problem, there he is. Really? Already? I mean, we going already? We going well, well, Jackie I, was just I, reminding me that I didn't give you the link today because because I'm I'm reducing my my uh, the, the, I'm oh, harm no. reducing now that I've, I've I've made that four percent cola. He's a part of the boudoir. He's a part of the petty uh, boudoir now, but there's a little four percent cola uh, increase. Lord. Uh, oh Jack, my god, Jackie, you you can't you can't leave you can't leave now, Jackie. I'm sorry. Huh? I'm like I, you can't you can't leave. I, 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 it's like that. It's like that old Richard. <laughs> it's like that old Richard Pryor joke. You know, it's like 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 uh no yeah you can go ahead and leave. But you're gonna have a problem getting out that door, you know. So like when your woman leaves you, <laughs> you just try getting out that door. You can't leave me, woman. You can't leave me. I, I hate now, to I hate to leave you with him, but I you know, gotta got gotta make the donuts today. Hey, we but gotta as represent much as I... for the hair. We gotta represent for the hair. Thank you for the yes, follic- yes. For, the, for the follically inclined. For the, gotta... fo- for, for the follically blessed, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. I'm so, so foul. <laughs> so, so, but the, but just real quick though, the the four percent cola thing uh, uh, is. I, I felt George Jackson's, you know, correct assessment from years ago because I went to the gas station the other day, uh, 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 yesterday. In fact, spent ninety dollars mm. at the and joint. Kind of so that cola. Got- I have, I have, I don't, I don't think it matters at this point. The, the gas is almost four dollars a gallon, and they oh. said it's going to get there by twenty by this year by by summer. Yeah, I've read recently it's going to get a, a, a over four dollars a gallon. So there goes my four percent mm. uh, right there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I you know I have a regular uh, SUV. Now you and... sound like you got one of them ninety Suburbans, bro. That sounds like one of them. <laughs> One of them joints. I'm telling you, I in. think it doesn't matter anymore. I think it doesn't matter anymore. I think Damn. I could drive a Kia or whatever the smallest whatever is at, at this point. And I, I had don't to think spend it, fifty dollars uh, uh, last week, and I was cussing. And that, plus, it was cold as hell the day I, I was out there, and I was cussing because because I, I have never had to spend fifty dollars to fill up any vehicle. And I literally oh, really? had to spend. I've never had to spend that much. Yeah. On, and I have an SUV too, but I've never had to. I even had a minivan at one point, and I've never had to spend over fifty dollars. Yeah, I, 40 40 bucks I, I need an app. Yeah. No. I, I, go, app. I mean, I got, I got a cost. I need to find a gas app. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah. 
got kids that like man. to eat, man. So I got <laughs> Yep, send them in the Costco. <laughs> they do want food, don't they? All of, they they always do want hungry. some food. Like you just ate yesterday. Damn. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Your parents are terrible. <laughs> One of you doesn't want to let your child out of the house ever. <laughs> the other one doesn't want listen, to feed the children. Listen, we had that conversation. I heard y'all talking about that. We did have that conversation, <laughs> like literally about about arranged marriages. We would go back. We will go back to feudal. To we might not. We might not like capitalism. We might not like capitalism, but we lo we love feudalism. <laughs> well, I was told. I was told by a higher authority to be quiet. Arranged marriages. <laughs> but 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 he's looking at pointing back. <laughs> Exactly. Y'all are awful. We're this working is, out. No, this is we not. Gotta work that is, out. Work. I had to advocate on behalf of uh, the 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 children of my of my brothers here. This is not. This is not good. We don't well, regress in the movement. But people. you know, but you know who the parents are. Why is that a bad thing? I don't understand either. Because they have they have the right to choose. No, they don't. Their own. No, they, no, they don't. They have no <laughs> right. They have no rights. None. Y'all are a bunch is, of fascist is, parents. Let me is, find out yes, y'all are fascist yes, parents. Yes, you're right. That is yes. that is absolutely the, that is the imposition of, of European imperialism on there. They talk about all these individual rights and, <laughs> and, and and all that kind of nonsense. It's nonsense. They need to just just they have a right to properly represent our family and extend the bloodline. That's it. <laughs> Even, you couldn't even hold that one for yourself. <laughs> you knew how crazy that sounded. I just like I just like coming on here and acting like I have any authority whatsoever. That's all. Like I have anything to say. I just like to pretend. That's all. That's all. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and and I and I can't. You know, I can't. I, I'm not. I, and I'm I'm just joking because I, I as someone who who does not have children, who has never had children. I, I'm in no place to criticize how anyone raises their children. I can barely manage this dog over here. So, mm. you know. I was going to bring that up because I see some of the stuff that you post that he does. He's, uh, he's, he's a said. person. Yeah. Nah, it oh, would be, it, Sorry about that. Nah, it, it, would be great. it would be great if we had, you know, a, a society where we wouldn't have to worry so much though about, you know, who our children are going to go out there and get, you know, but um, that is, that, that that, that's, nice. that's a, that's a frightening thing though. When you think about like <clears throat> what's out here now, uh, it's, it's hard just as a, as a, as a person who's, you know, been single, it was hard enough for me to find somebody much less, you know, the, 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 the children. So I just, I wonder like what the future is going to look like. Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I look at, I, I look at how my mom and my aunt, was so overprotective of my cousin and I. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, we grew up here in DC uh, around the, the, during the whole, you know, crack epidemic. And, <clears throat> and they were, you know, so there was, there was the, the protectiveness that they developed, uh, this overprotectiveness that they developed because of that. Uh, but before then, you know, they were just like, look, y'all go outside and play. And, and cause it was mm -hmm. a really great neighborhood to grow up in, but and by the time I was in high school, it was, yeah, it was a whole different story. It was a whole, yeah. you know, who are you hanging around? What what are you doing? And, and you know, that kind of thing. And now I don't know how I would be raising teenagers um, because there are so, there really are so many pitfalls out here for kids and, and the things that so many kids uh, uh, think is fun just kind of scares me a little bit. And I'm 55 and I'm just... Yeah. Like I, I don't know if that's fun or not, but you know, I, I, I can see having a problem uh, being the parent who is not the the warrior, who's not the you know the helicopter parent, who's who's not you know downloading the app on their kid's phone to track where they are all the time. I, I can, I can see me being that kind of parent because I know the world is 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 dangerous. Um, and, and it's, I cannot imagine what it's like to let your, your progeny, to let your babies, no matter how old they are out into that world. I feel for my dad. Cause he, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm 55 and he's still like, if I don't call that dude every seven days, he's like, you all right? What you did? Do you need anything? What's what's going on? Mm -hmm. I ain't heard from you. Have have you called your brother? I'm like, dude, I'm I'm chilling in my house. I'm okay. I'm mm -hmm. oh, you gotta let me know. I can't go driving at night by myself. 
So basically, you know, so basically, you're making our case for arranged marriage. I you know, am. You know you I just am. Did you just, I, am. You just did. I am. I I got Yo. rather lucky. So, so Jared, let the let let the uh, higher authority hear that clip, <laughs> and perhaps coming from you know another woman. I, I'm not saying I don't know if the higher authority is a woman or not. So, I, so let me just say that. But I'm just assuming, always just assume <laughs> absolutely okay, and well always. Then, that's what I assume. So yeah, let's be clear. Let, so let her know that yeah. you know there's another woman who who has a little bit more perspective. Uh, so yeah. I mean, I bueno, buenas, buenas. There I could, I could, I, 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 I'm not gonna hate on arranged marriages. I'm, I'm not because you know it's, it's been a thing in cultures that we do not live in for centuries, millennia, probably, and uh works out fine in in many 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 cases uh probably can't do as bad as you know choosing your own mate with a divorce rate in this country so who am i to knock arranged marriages i'm i'm not i'm not that one and just just so we're clear just jared and i are are joking about it. you know for those who you know we, we, we are all serious. Oh we my God. are we are joking about <laughs> arranged marriages we don't next really, thing you know it's going to be they're polygamists we, we, we don't really mean uh, that we're into arranged marriages. That is not something that we, you know, advocate at all. <laughs> wow, uh, man, California already over uh, four dollars in gas price. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, yeah nope. they, they, they're always around four. That's it. Not going to California. That's that's, that's the best. That's, that's, that's the best part of the go. arranged marriage you right don't have there. To pay we for already it. have the music. That's <laughs> you it. don't even have to pay. You don't have that's to pay it. for the band. That's nope. already there. That's it. Uh -oh. That's it. There okay. it is. Boom. It's a wrap. Okay, there it is. Okay. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> that I told like you I was good. Wedding, man. Uh, yeah, I, hey, it's 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 you know, we have limited production value right here, right here so far. You know I mean? <laughs> anyway, for real though, Jackie. Let's bring a little. Let, let's give a little bit of of substance this morning before you do have to get out of here. I don't want you to just 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 dip. Uh, and I've um, been trying to keep you around. That's why I was bringing up all. I know, I know. <laughs> but then she's going to leave. And this, yeah. Anyway, I, I see what you're doing, and I won't be able to come back because you know we got an early schedule this morning on by any means necessary. Oh, okay. So, um, and uh, we are we are talking Let's about. Yes, it's Sean the Voice Blackman, uh, who just celebrated a birthday, by the way. He was real oh, really? low key about it. Yeah, okay. real low key about it, but he did. Um, Capricorn. So, all right, happy birthday! Yeah, happy belated birthday. Capricorn. Yeah, he. Uh, so, so today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, Sudan, and we've been, you know, pretty consistently raising the issues um, uh, on around the uprisings on the continent in different regions on the show uh, as they happen. And, you know, it's interesting that uh, yesterday was the anniversary of the assassination of Amilcar Cabral. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, I, I, I came to know about Cabral late, like literally within the past, like five or six years, which is very strange. I mean, I would hear his name, uh, but I didn't know much about him. And then when I began to read about him, then I kind of understood why he's not talked about as much hmm. and <laughs> how important he is, not just to the struggle for uh, national liberation for, you know, oppressed people and against imperial uh, imperialism. But I think he is so important to the struggle we are in still, not just on the continent and <clears throat> everywhere around the world that uh, working class and poor people are opposing uh, their former colonial powers, still uh, oppressing them uh, and, and also imperialism. But also here, I think that the most important thing, at least for me, that, that Cabral raised was the role of culture in uh in in societies and in the way culture is connected with a society's development in the first place and how a liberation movement is like the cultural expression of resistance against the politics that are you know 
that 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 uh, that an oppressed people face. So so Cabral, I think, says that. Uh, uh, liberation movements are the cultural expression of the politics of a people. Um, so, and, and his argument, and I can absolutely see this, was that uprisings are seeded in the culture of oppressed people who are dealing with uh, the violence and the political repression and the economic repression uh, that they uh, are experiencing from, at the time he was talking about colonial powers, and that was Portugal. Um, <clears throat> but I see this now um, in so many of the struggles on the continent where, and in Haiti, uh, and in Colombia, and, and, I, and I especially kind of, it. I don't know why, I just especially made that connection for me in Colombia, um, because I think I had never been anywhere where I had been around a a um, a pointedly radical and overtly African culture that was involved in political uprising. So going to Colombia when I did last year in October was and and you know I, I've read some of <clears throat> excuse me Cabral's works and it was like yeah this is good yeah this is good but but in Colombia I felt it all of a sudden it made sense how important the culture is because it's I mean it's one thing for us to sit here in the United States I think in the belly of the beast um in as Sean says the beating heart of empire and call ourselves African and be in tune with African culture uh, in its, you know, what we believe to be its purest forms, you know, from African artists and uh, African art and, and that kind of, and, the, and that kind of stuff is good to read African authors and, and that kind of stuff. And, and to also be engaged in um, uh, solidarity with Africans who are involved in their, their liberation struggles. But it's another thing to be not from the continent, to suddenly be around people whose DNA comes from the exact same place mine does, who use their Africanness, their uh, uh, the the music, the spiritual worship the traditions, the beliefs, using the drum, having ceremonies, uh, calling on the Orishas before they go into a mass movement demonstration protest that shuts the city down while they are literally battling uh, the police and the military in Buenaventura, you know, setting up altars uh, that are very African to the deities to protect them and to give them strength through this battle. It was a different thing to be in that environment where indigenous people in Colombia and African uh, Afro-Colombians saw their culture, their religious beliefs, their spiritual practices, their traditions, their music um, as a part of their politics. So it was incredibly important for them to be very overt and open about those things and to like when when there's a conference to have a, um, uh, to have a prayer and to have an altar and to call on the Orishas before a political conference. You know what I mean? So so it was like there in Colombia when I'm around all these people who are who are African, African, right? And who are indigenous, indigenous, but who see their struggle against the Colombian government and imperialism as a struggle that is also an attempt by those forces, not just to oppress them economically and to exploit their labor, but also to crush them as a people, to make it impossible for them to express and enjoy their culture. And that's when it hit me what Cabral was saying, that culture is the 
uh, in liberation struggles, culture is the uh, uh, the political expression of, of the of the liberation struggle. So when we look at people in Sudan and we look at people in Mali and Haiti and uh, all uh, across the continent and in the Americas, when they're involved in uh, mass protests, we often see them dancing. We often hear them singing. And that is, I think, a modern day example of what Cabral was saying, the importance of culture and its place in liberation struggles, because people are not just fighting against, uh, you know, not being able to make a living, not having ownership of the land. They're also fighting against the destruction of their history. And what is, what is history if it's not culture, if it's not the culture of a people as it develops? Or what is culture if it's not the history of a people as it develops? So I, I just really, I, I, I definitely need to learn more about uh, Amakar Cabral. I mean, obviously his, his armed revolution uh, with the PAIGC, and I think it was a 12 year war with a, a Portuguese army, um, resulted in the liberation of uh, Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde, but after his assassination by the per Portuguese. But his ideology was so powerful that he even inspired some of his former enemies in the Portuguese army to turn around and use his principles to themselves oppose the fascist Portugal, Portuguese regime and then topple the Portuguese regime and bring uh, a democracy to Portugal. So I, I, I think that in, in our, in our um, discussions about today's culture, uh, entertainment, movies, music, books, I, I think that the reason so many of us, folks like us, get so ticked off about movies and music and books uh, and media personalities that are supposed to be representative of the culture, things that folks are running around producing all kinds of shitty content talking about this is for the culture. We understand that's not culture. And that, that's why we get so angry at it. But I, may, I, I don't think I ever connected my like anger at Beyonce, I really don't like her, but <laughs> to, to my understanding that, that her, her wonderful bars, it's not culture. It's not the culture that's going to get us liberated. That that's, that's the point. And I think the point that Amilcar Cabral made about the importance of culture is that we in this movement for liberation have to be clear on what our culture is and put it in its proper place in this movement, or else we will be led by folks like Beyonce and Al Sharpton and such. <laughs> so while you while you were talking, I just jumped to off to grab Absolutely. Return to the Source. Absolutely. And, yes. if, and, yes. and there's so much, I mean, I've, I've just, oh man, I got my note cards falling out. I got, I mean, <laughs> uh, but just real quick, uh, as, as, as Cabral wrote, to, just to your point, uh, Jackie, when Goebbels, the brain behind Nazi propaganda, heard culture being discussed, he brought out his revolver. I always liked that line. Mm -hmm. Goebbels mm -hmm. knew knew what he knew what he was he knew what the point was. That shows that the Nazis, who were and are the most tragic expression of imperialism and its thirst for domination, even if they were all degenerates like Hitler, had a clear idea of the value of culture as a factor of resistance to foreign domination. History teaches us that in certain circumstances, it is very easy for the foreigner to impose his domination on a people, but it also teach, teaches us that whatever may be the material aspects of this domination, it, it can be maintained only by the permanent organized repression of the cultural life of the people concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like so. the, the importance of culture is, is, is very <laughs> deep. I mean, when you, you talked about those re re rebellions, they go all the way back to the fact that but prior to going to war, Africans, you know, traditional African society, you would do they would do ritual and mm -hmm. before going to war. Um, 
and we have in the culture, in the spiritual culture, a tradition of warrior gods like Ogun, Raharakti, mm -hmm. and Orgu, and other places. I mean, several others. You know, so when you know, for instance, in, before Haiti, you know, you had Cecil Fateman, you had uh, Toussaint, and all of them. They actually did a ritual. I mean, it was it was uh, Dessalon who said, you know, throw away the white man's gods. You know, claim your own. Basically, he was saying claim your own culture. Right. Before they went to war. Nat Turner, the same thing. Zumbi, the same thing. And these are people who have been disconnected from uh, Africa, you know, just uh, directly. But still, that cultural was latent, latent in it. And I think it's important because culture in its true powerful sense, in order to really express itself most powerfully, it has to be political. And unfortunately, in this society, they depoliticize the culture and make it some kind of weak, kind of nice. You know, you just dance and you just. And so when, sometimes when people uh, hear culture, that's what they think about. They think about the, the milk to toast version of culture, which is why the State Department is, again, they understand like Goebbels and they get all these artists to go around the world and do mm -hmm. America's bidding because they understand the power of culture. And Cabral's, one of my favorite Cabral, Cabral quotes, uh, quotes was, you measure a people's potential for liberation based on how different their culture is from their right. oppressors. From mm -hmm. their oppressors. That's what he so, said. So, but my one question, the only question I have about, well, not the only, that's 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 incorrect. Let me rephrase that. One question I've always had, where I've had for years about Cabral that I haven't found an answer to, so I'm happy if anybody in the chat knows or anyone or you, if either of you knows or someone else can contact me. In passing in here, he 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 makes the point to say that Black Americans are not internally colonized, but he does not explain himself. And I've never, <coughs> I, I, it, it, you know, it was in that the, the discussion with black students, uh, but they don't, they, there's no explanations or elaboration. So I, I, if anybody knows uh, uh, where that answer could be found or if they have the answer or, or, or whatever, I would love to hear it because um, I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not sure. But I Ooh. think I, what the first thing that jumped in my mind and I, I'm not in Cabral's head. So I don't know. This is just my opinion is that maybe he meant that literally that we're not internally colonized in our own land, that maybe we mm. were kind of expropriated to, you know, other other people's lands. And maybe yeah, that's, that's, maybe that's why that, that to me, that make that would make sense if that's what he meant. Yeah, I, I would. I would have to kind of see that. I would, yeah, have, to, I would okay. have to see the rest of what he said around right. that. Because, mm -hmm. right. yeah. What I remember was that there was nothing around. There, like there was no context. Ooh. It was okay. just a passing oh, comment. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna look for it again while we're here. But, but just in case. But that was. I've, I've just. I mean, that makes sense. What you're saying makes sense. Um, but, yeah. Anyway. Anyway. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know. I think his his. Um, his and I'm not going to say it's his concept, but what he said about re-Africanization, um, I, I think that I think that's really deep because you know we 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 put so much we, we dismiss when people you know change their name right and and people always say well you know I don't I don't want to keep the slave name and I remember Abdus telling me that he he had this struggle with his family and and you know, his family still calls him by his you know birth Christian name to this day. Um, and you know, that's, that, that's, it just is what it is, but, you know, <laughs> and I don't mean to be, and I know all due respect, but I, I don't know how, cause I don't remember this coming up or did it at his service. Cause, cause, cause on several occasions I've gone to someone's, to someone's service mm -hmm. and that tension comes out where the family members come up to pay tribute and refuse to acknowledge <laughs> And I don't mean to make light of it, but sometimes it has brought a little bit of humor in they those, stress in those it. They stress that name. They stress too. it. They're like, yeah. and Johnny and then, they look, and, then they, and then they look at you, and then they look at all of the, all his friends right. that they call him from now. <laughs> well, well, see, okay. So so that did not was, happen mama, at, at Abdus. If, if no, mama called him Clay, I'm going to call him Clay. No, it, it, yeah. it not, that that, that did not that, happen at Abdus. Okay, 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 good. I, I did. Y'all yeah, couldn't remember, right, right. Yeah, right. because there were some that. family members I did not allow to speak. Mm. And that was okay, because he okay. told me to. That, mm. I mean, literally. That, <laughs> wow. No, I'm serious. It just, I've already got a list. Yes. I've left a list. <laughs> It was that I don't have some... much to pass on, but we I believe left that. Don't you? We believe, don't you believe that. that? We believe I that. I used to think he was kidding when he would say, "Look, if anything happens to me, 
don't let so-and-so speak at my funeral acting like they gave a damn. And I'm just like, oh, man, stop. And then I met them mugs. I'm like, oh, stop. Oh, that's oh, what he meant. Yeah, that's yeah. what. Yeah. No, so I'm it, very it, serious. It, it, I'm like, I have a, it's, I have a do not invite, much less do not speak list. Yeah, like, I mean, I couldn't do come. that. You know, I, I, I couldn't do that. But yeah, well, one of these days I'm, I'm going to tell the story of that damn funeral. It, it was wild. <laughs> um, but well, you yeah, handled it. You, whatever drama there was, we couldn't tell. You had a list. Right. I was going to say, on our end, it, it, yeah. it, it, it seemed but I, to go but I understand, out of hit. But yeah. I, I understand exactly what you mean, and, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Because I was like, if, 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 if there were ever a time for, like, a haunting to happen, now would be good. Now would be great. I mean, <laughs> at, at any time. Come on, babe. Come on back. Just, you know. So, but yeah, so, so no, they did, people did not do that at, at his funeral, but I remember, but he, he, but he told me all the time that he would explain to people, you know, why would you change your name? And he said, well, because aside from the fact that it is a part of my faith as uh, a Muslim, because he was a Muslim at the time he had converted to Islam and the name was given to him. Uh, he said, you know, th this is the name that I was born with, those are not the names of my ancestors. Nobody mm -hmm. on the continent was named uh, uh, Johnson. Ain't no Johnsons in, in Africa that my people came from. So the best that we can do, because we don't know where we come from on the continent, is to make that connection uh, by intentionally um, uh, 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 identifying ourselves as African. That 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 is the best we can do right now. And you know, folks were just like, you know, but you're not African. And it was just like, but yes, we are African. We are indeed African. We're you know, our, our DNA doesn't doesn't uh, uh, exist. It, it doesn't uh, 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 what's the word originate. Our DNA doesn't originate on this continent. Our DNA originates on the African continent. Therefore, mm -hmm. we are African. And it, it was just a struggle that he had with, you know, members of his own family, you know, folks that he worked with, folks who, oh, I can't pronounce your name. You can pronounce Tchaikovsky, but you can't pronounce Abdul Shahid Luqman. Get out of here. <laughs> you know, so, Jackie. you know, the, the idea of re-Africanization that Cabal, Cabral had to, to um, bring us back to our roots and our culture very very important you know it's so funny you know you talk about people that say they're not african and then they'll say i'm not african i'm part i'm part irish i'm part this they'll even say part native american but uh, yeah. but they will never but they will never say what without any proof by the native american by the way <laughs> usually in most cases but then but 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 they're not african they, they say they're everything else you know uh but, except the obvious you know, <laughs> you know, we all got some Indian in us. That's right. We all got some. Indian. I had an Irish friend in the Navy from Boston. He he said I couldn't even. He said if 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 he brought me home to his neighborhood, he would that I would literally be killed, and then mm -hmm. he would be beaten within an inch of his life for bringing me to his neighborhood. So I can only, I can't imagine going actually to Ireland. <laughs> just no disrespect to the Irish. I'm just playing. It's just jokes. It's just a little joke here in the morning. A little a little racial. But he did tell me that. He did tell me he was from one of those neighborhoods where where um Goodwill Hunting was from. Yeah. And uh wow. uh he was like, We don't, we don't that would not be, you know, so Boston anyway. ain't no joke, man. Boston nah. is rough. It's just one of the can I, cities in America. Yeah. Speaking, of, but real quick, with Ray, I just got some breaking news, and Jackie, I want you to, to I want you to enjoy what, meat this loaf, bit meatloaf of, dying. Of, oh what, man, that's what? messed up. What's your did beef he? against meatloaf? No, he died. Did meat, meatloaf oh, died? He's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Oh man. Oh, that was great. That's well, what I thought the breaking news was. Oh, I'm nah, say, nah, why this, do you hate meatloaf? No, nah, I, I don't hate meatloaf. My meat breaking, loaf. but on some level, well, I used well, to eat meatloaf too. <laughs> oh. My not not like you know, that. My, my breaking like news. literal meatloaf. I'm sorry. Yeah. Anyway, you know, uh, anyway. like buses going between New, you know DC and Baltimore. Not that kind, but I'm talking about. <laughs> this this is this, this is my breaking <laughs> news is is but it is actually more petty and and uh, 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 shout out to Schadenfreude because. Mm -hmm. um, if folks will remember back during mm -hmm. the last election, 
so much of the argument around why we must support Biden was because unlike Trump, at least the Democrats would would appoint more progressive federal judges and that this was super important. That's what they said. That's that was that was a, a, a virtual social media bludgeon used for a better part of that election cycle. And to see this bit of news here that uh, as Steven Donziger says that he is outraged because Donziger, by the way, was the whistleblower that snitched on, well, I guess it's not snitching, but he blew the whistle on Chevron and was, you know, nearly destroyed for it. So he's particularly upset, but I think everybody could chime in on this, that he's outraged to learn that Biden has named Chevron lawyer, Jennifer Reardon, to be a federal judge. She was paid millions to help jail me, attack indigenous people, and cover up a massive oil spill in the Amazon. But there's your new Biden appointed federal judge. And uh, I know all of the push him left crowd is just, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Build back better. Well, you know, I got, since Whoa. you said Build that, back I, better. I, I got something to, I got something to, to share uh, in that regard, uh, since you brought it up. And since, since I we, brought it up, since, since we're on the petty, you know, why not? Uh, <laughs> you know, so we, we flick can, so far. I just didn't want Jackie to miss out on that before she left. And I, I didn't want, you know, I wanted, now, I didn't now want I'm, to, Now I'm irate. Thank you. There, that's what, yeah, you know, like, like, I mean, anyway, that's just my favorite. The only other, the only one, the only one that was more of my favorite was when it was argued to me on Twitter that that uh, the federal judge issue in particular would be a benefit uh, because it was said that I, since I have an affinity for political prisoners, that that uh, federal judges appointed by Biden would be more likely to support the, the plight of political prisoners. Oh my God! <laughs> and wouldn't the they appreciate? <laughs> right. So I, the first call I made that day was to Daruba. Shout out to Daruba Ben Wahad, and just to just, just to hear a quick what that motherfucker set the foot, what the foot, and then he got on and did it, and it's on it's on there. We did it. We did an episode about it. It's a, it's on the channel. Oh my god! Uh, uh, and he because I said Daruba, what, what about this argument that political prisoners would appreciate a democratic, you know, a federal judge appointed by Joseph what the Biden? Hell is he smoking. <laughs> oh, I don't know what we're looking at your settings there, brother Kaba. Oh, you don't see the uh, the you don't see the screen. No. Okay. So. Yeah, no, we see your settings screen. We were okay. we were looking at your your uh, right. audio. Right. In, 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 you know. So All I was right. like, I don't know if that was the headline news. No, that Kaba got his his audio <laughs> set up. <laughs> nah, let me let me let me get it. He's like breaking news. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, that was that was my favorite though. Which was okay. when was when that part was argued. You know, um, and if yeah. you want, you can send the, about the link in a private chat, and I'll do it. And do you see it? No, I don't see any. No, nope. Nope, nothing nope, yet. No, nothing. Nope. Why, why do I always have issues with this thing? We're gonna we gonna get this right. We're gonna we're gonna make it. It's we're it's gonna make it's, it. It's it's okay. Um, well, I, I, you know, boomer is what the word that comes to mind that I hear from my <laughs> children all the time. It's not generationally accurate necessarily, not, but everything is just boomerism. Uh, there we go. There, there we, we go. go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Everyone so, should be. Huh? Everyone should be held to the highest standard, but Congress should decide its own stock. Stock. Oh, of course. Trading value. What? You know. So that's Jen Psaki. Of course, she's the uh, the spokesperson for for Biden. She was asked if members of. I don't know if you can hear this or not, but I'm a. Nope. You got to click that that audio dialogue box when you share uh, your tiny tab. dialogue and audio I gotta, I gotta do another thing over here <laughs> you gotta do another thing you gotta unshare you gotta, you gotta stop me. sharing you gotta and stop gotta, sharing you gotta, gotta reshare share again and then click this the is, audio dialogue box this is I mean, what happens how many when... <laughs> how many more pandemics are necessary for us to <laughs> I, do, I don't see the dialogue box it's a box it's, that it's a teeny don't... tiny little box at you the bottom you should just send me the link and that, no, and I'm going to do it. this, man. I'm going to do this, man. I, I, this I can, is what I, happens when middle-aged nope. people do podcasts and videos. Uh, share shows. screen. It says share screen. <laughs> oh, I see it. I see it. I see it. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I really sound old, but don't I? Uh, <laughs> 
Yep. <laughs> See, that, <laughs> y'all were hearing all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I'm not sure I told you I'm, I'm getting my RM Brown on. I told you I got I got my <laughs> app and wait till I wait till I learn how to set it up to run through the thing. I'm man. wait till I get man, you should just send me the link in just, the private chat, man. Okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. This is, um <laughs> and let me pull it up because um, you know. You just okay. struggling a little. Oh, no, no, no. Bit. I got, it. I got it now. I got it now. I got it now. He's got it now. Everybody, you got it. You got it. You here to see that? Okay. So you, can you see it? He's got it, everybody. There can it you is. See it? Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Saki was asked. Mm-hmm. She was. She was asked. Uh, you know what? What she thought about you know Congress being able to basically trade you know stocks and stuff. Uh, and this is what her response was. Um, does the president think that members of Congress should be prohibited from trading stocks? The president is prohibited from doing this. So where does he stand on this? And should their spouses be too? Uh, the president uh, didn't trade individual stocks when he was a senator. Um, that is how he approached things. He also believes that uh, everyone should be held to the highest standard, but he'll let uh, members of the leadership in Congress and members of Congress determine what the rules should be. Yeah. Everybody should be held to the same standard, except, except. the people in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, she said that's how you approach it. Now, this article also went on to say that Biden has been, you know, it was true that he didn't stay, trade stocks when he was, you know, in Congress and that he's one of the least uh, wealthy among the people. But he's, of course, still a, a millionaire. So uh, I thought that was funny. But yeah, that was it. That was, that's all I wanted to share. Yeah. Everyone should be held to the same standard, except these people who can decide what that standard is for themselves. Yeah. And then what's the difference if 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 they don't trade themselves and they just give the information to their hedge fund husband like mm-hmm. Pelosi and then well, he they said has... they said they said they said um spouses too but again they they got connections with other folks, folks exactly. well, so it doesn't really matter if it's... I mean I know it's it's absurd and then uh uh and of course uh um it's absurd it's an absurd an absurdity put on top of an already absurd claim of a free market and and all of this other equality that we all could invest oh. and do da 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 and um uh yeah and that's going to be my segue to um when i when i get into cuz i got some more we're going to have to do another like this week in crypto hate in 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 a, in a, in a few minutes uh um you know, but anyway, Jackie, since I know you do have to go, what, you know, yep. any, let me really let, let you do what you, you don't, you shouldn't, you, don't have to go. you know, I, nobody I'm, is, is, is desirous of I it. can get you, uh, I can get you the day off. Let me call you a super. <laughs> I'll get you the day off. Hey, look, they're letting me you work care, from home. They're letting me broadcast from home. Her. Don't mess this up for me, Kaba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because some of us have to go back to work. And actually, that's something I want to talk about before we even get to that. I got I, I just got sent another story that I want to get to before that uh, uh, about uh, um, uh, the academic world uh, mm. as I as I am being mandated back into the to the to the physical classroom uh, and just had to go through uh, and get my my covid test yesterday so that I can. So you weren't back before? Return. I thought you had come back already in first semester. We we had a sort of flex situation where it was largely left up to students and faculty more or less everybody was working it out on their own okay. so i was i was going in but but not um not not with the level of frequency and not with the full classrooms that we're going to have now and at least allegedly who knows what's really going to happen but uh yeah. but th- there was a new story out in the chronicle of higher education that dr todd Stephen burroughs sent me this morning that that i think that i want to talk about before we do this week in, in crypto hate uh um anyway because i you know it's just a, it's just a, a, a i think an accurate look at, at the situation i am walking back into so <laughs> you know cool. anyway um but anyway sister jackie thank you very much for coming through this morning it's thank always a pleasure for having me and time. And, uh, you know, good luck at the day job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Peace, y'all. Y'all behave. Peace, peace, no peace. arranged right. marriages. Well, while yeah. don't, don't be arranging marriages for oh, your kids. Oh, no. Oh, we would oh. never do that. Oh, we would oh. never, ever do that. Oh. We'll, we'll be on our best behavior. Oh, boy. Okay. Lighten the candles. Look at the smile. All right. look, at, look at the smile. See? Lighten the candles for y'all. Bye. <laughs> All right, everybody. Much love to Jackie. Uh, you know, before, but before, because I have actually done um, another uh, um, uh, 
kind of an academic deep dive into the crypto thing. Um, but man, anyway, um, so let me, you know what, let me do a quick transition and then let's get to some crypto. I mean, get to this academic thing and into the crypto thing. We'll be back here in just a quick second here at I Mix what I like on Black Power Media. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, everybody. Uh, this this story came out in the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, I think just today. Um, and it's, it's, I think, an interesting uh, um, take on what's going on in the, the, the world of higher education. Uh, Kevin R. McClure and uh, Alyssa Hicklin Fryer, if I'm saying that correctly, um, co-authored this piece. And as they put here, uh, yeah, Hicklin Fryer, Alyssa Hicklin Fryer. Um, so they're talking about, uh, the, well, as they start off with, as many observers have pointed out, the great resignation doesn't perfectly capture what's happening in the U.S. labor market. Data suggests many people, especially those with jobs in fields like hospitality, aren't quitting the workforce, but rather jumping to better opportunities. In much the same way, the great resignation doesn't perfectly capture what's happening on college campuses. Faculty members, as unhappy as many of them are, are largely staying put. What has changed is how they approach their jobs. Uh, uh, just skipping ahead a little bit here, uh, as I've underlined there at the bottom of the page, nevertheless, most faculty members aren't making big job moves for them. The great resignation looks different. We should describe it, uh, as disengagement. They are withdrawing from certain aspects of the job or in more emotional level from the institution itself. Faculty members are not walking away in droves, but they are waving goodbye to norms and systems that prevailed in the past. They are still teaching their courses, supporting students, and trying to keep up with their tasks. But connection to the institution has been frayed. The work is getting done, but there isn't much spark to it. Um, just a little bit more here, because I, I, I don't know, I feel like when I read this, it just resonates. In response to our Twitter thread, that apparently they did something on Twitter, people said they were doing what they must, but nothing extra. They said they used to be rah-rah, they used to be a rah-rah team player, but not anymore. They used to feel strong ties to their institution, but they have since felt so undervalued that they're cutting back. One response that especially stood out to us, quote, faculty might not be quitting, but they've left the building. Sometimes departure is a state of mind, end quote. It's important to note that disengagement doesn't suggest laziness or that faculty members are necessarily are shirking their core responsibilities. Uh, moving ahead just a little bit, what, what is being said here is that uh, people responded to our thread with unmistakable fury and a palpable sense of betrayal over how decisions were made and how faculty and staff members have been treated as a result of those decisions and that there's always been a slow simmering conflict between the faculty and the administration. Um, that said, many, many people also acknowledge that there were problems prior to the pandemic and confounding factors at play. States have cut funding to public higher education while salaries for faculty and staff members have stagnated. Diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts have often failed to meaning meaningfully improve the lived experiences and career opportunities of scholars of color. Legislatures have targeted higher education as a front line in the culture wars, turning governing boards into political spoils and legitimate scholarship into punishable crimes. And so we don't lay the blame entirely at the feet of college leaders whose morale also matters as they navigate incredibly difficult conditions. I feel like I want to challenge that part a little bit, but, you know, all respect due to the authors and their point of view. Uh, we also don't discount the possibility that all of us are just sick and tired of, well, everything. After years of pandemic living and working, we may be desperate. We may be desperate for change, something new, something fresh. Disengagement is perhaps the pinnacle of feeling stuck in a bad rerun. Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, just a little bit more here, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Uh, there could also be less creativity, less risk taking. Faculty members may feel disinclined to pursue big and bold projects. They may look askance at leadership roles. Students could students could certainly feel the effects, especially as they have come to rely on faculty members for emotional support to continue their studies. And so faculty members refusing as their power allows to go the extra mile may be an important wake up call for institutions. Yeah, this is they get a little hopeful here uh, and I and and, you know, before they before they ultimately pull it back. But um, ultimately, reengaging faculty will require rebuilding relationships and the foundation of that project is trust. Making a concerted effort to invest in shared governance structures and process can go a long way towards repaired to, toward repairing broken relationships between faculty and administration. Our big fear is that college leaders won't do anything. Um, Anyway, so I, 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 like I said, this this article resonated with me, uh, resonates with me, and I think says a lot about the environment many of us as faculty members are going back into. Um, and uh, yeah, and I do think students are going to suffer if they're not already from from all of this. Um, so anyway, and I think it's also right. just indicative of just workers in general, you know, like the mm -hmm. situation of workers in general. I, and, and and many workers have already kind of had to deal with that stuff, obviously. And I think it also speaks to the disinvestment in education um, yeah. of America, uh, because many of those jobs that people are trained for are just not there anymore, uh, or everything's being automated. You know, that's been in the works for decades, but we're really starting to see, you know, the chickens come home to roost, roost now. Yeah, you know, in terms of that, I mean, they. I understand they have like some some universities have GAs and graduate assistants, like in other countries now. They're paying it because they can pay them. I mean, they never really paid the ones here that much anyway, but now they can pay them less than that. So now they're, right. they've been they've been doing that for years, you know, in some institutions. So it just sounds like it's 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 following the same logical course that it would, you know, now and it, and people and people feel that like you're working in a particular situation. You, you have you were passionate because you know to be most educators i know were passionate about education that's why they got into it they want to teach they love learning they love knowledge they love the, you know disseminating the knowledge inspiring young people all of those things you know and so the work is not as fulfilling as it was now because you have all these you know different constraints and then you have and i think the pandemic simply exacerbated all of those issues and just just blew it up you know and yeah. especially when it comes to education because that's something that you need one-on-one, -on -one, you know, hands-on for the most part, for, for most students. I know my children have definitely, you know, suffered because of the fact that they had to, I mean, because of what's, what's you know, how things are, you know, understandably so, you know, but at the same time, it's still just not the ideal situation. We talk about children earlier and just them growing up. And I, I feel bad for my children in a sense now because they don't get a chance to, to go out and do stuff. Right. My, my right. oldest, really. That he doesn't get a chance to. I remember just being able to go to the mall or hang out or whatever with my friend, go to my friend's house, and they're just not really able to do that to the extent that they used to. So, and we see how this mental health um, issue crisis is big for children now to the point where, you know, I think I, I forget who it was. Uh, I, I saw I saw a story about uh, a company that's partnering with schools now um, to have to have like this text number for children, if they're going through some mental health crisis, they could text, you know, a certain you know, group of people. It's the sister that runs it, uh, who actually are trained, uh, to, you know, counselors, you know, because they because they know going to the counselor's office, the guidance counselor's office may have a stigma to it. So but they know a, a child is more apt to pick up their phone and go and text and say, well, I, I need some help. I need, you know, so that's the era that we're living in now. And these are young. These are younger children, not even not to mention college age, you know, so it's just it's just a sad situation all the way around, man. And I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, uh, yeah, it is. And, and, and I know, uh, well, I'll just speak for myself that the, it, it, it can wear the, you know, battles with administration, battles with the structure, uh, um, the, the worsening or the, the worsening impact of, uh, well, the pandemic just exacerbates existing tensions. I mean, so if you have, and then, you know, um, uh, and it does require conscious efforts to maintain a certain level of engagement with students and a certain attitude and approach. 
um because it can it can wear on you i mean it or wear on me i'll just speak for myself it is it, it has worn on me um over the years so i you know i i get it and then you go back and, and i'm going back to four classes a semester um uh which for faculty i mean it's just it's just anyway i don't want to just start complaining about my personal situation but 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 well, it's but it's connected. anyway. I just it's think it's connected thing. to the anyway. story, though. I think it's I think it's a good <laughs> yeah. thing that you talk about your person. I mean, because what what because you mentioned that before. I heard you mention that several times about the yeah, four classes. I'm sure. Why, why is that? Why is that problematic? Because I really, I mean, I I can imagine, but I'm not a I'm not a you know professor. So well, I mean, I, I mean, part of it, some of it is just simple, you know, common sense logic. I mean, more classes, more students. Uh, less time to give each student the individual focus they should get um, uh, and, um, you know, less energy just throughout the day. I mean, you know, you, you know, like, I, you know, for instance, I don't, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a little reserved even when I do these, these broadcasts, but in the classroom, I like to walk around, I'm animated. I like to have fun um put in some energy put, try to you know try to compensate for sometimes the low energy of students coming into the room uh you know i put in some effort into you know like a lot of faculty to planning and you know laying stuff out and um but when you have you know but sometimes just by the third class in the day it's just it's just the energy drains the the focus wanes the you know the 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 attention to specific students needs you know is is you know and then the time put into prep um uh you know i mean everything it just cuts down everything so the time like when when i you know so if you think back to if any of us think back to some of our <clears throat> favorite, uh, best uh, experiences on college campuses for me at least a lot of that time was being able to just pop up and see faculty individual faculty in their offices uh, or on campus somewhere. But when you're teaching four classes, that amount of time is limited. So even if you have set office hours, the amount of students that may come by uh, at a specific time might limit the amount of time you can give to, to certain students. Um, and then it, it, it uh, uh, anyway, so just that kind of engagement on campus, I think, is, is reduced. Um, Anyway, yeah, uh, uh, but most of it is just the time and the energy and the, the focus and all of, you know, uh, that I think um, ideally should go into, you know, when you think of like, you know, and a lot of the more famous, prominent scholars, many of whom have earned their, I this right. I was going to ask you about them. What do you, in which part? What do you mean? Well, well I was going to say, how does your, juxtapose your workload to some of the more po popular well scholars. one they're, they're making two three four five six times my salary and wow. they're teaching one class a semester or two maybe a semester and then to your point they have teaching assistants and graduate assistants most you know most of us many of us do not mm -hmm. um so that's another thing i mean if really? i if i give an if, i mean if i give if i give all of my classes assignments i mean i'm i'm grading a hundred assignments a week um never mind the time in the classroom uh you know if and these if, aren't just uh, abc assignments these are assignments sometimes that require like people writing and you have to kind of well I, I mean the way i do assignments because i i like the assignments i you know i like to be assigned the way i i like to be taught so my mm -hmm. assignments are watch and read something and then write or in this day and age i've allowed for for any sort of media productive you know so they can do it in audio or video but offer up your thoughts and response in some sort of patterned way um you know tell me what you think about so even if it's you know frankly even if it's boring or, or just drivel i mean it's still a hundred assignments so it's still and reading. that takes more time than and i asked that because that takes more time yeah. than, say, than saying the answer is a b c d whatever right 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 you just, like look at, you just look that up just, just, no, no, right 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 like yeah. you have to take it takes more to, you have to consider each and every answer from each yeah. and every student and even if i didn't it, it, but even for those who do multiple choice or have that kind of exam test i mean it's still it's still a lot of of, right. of grading it's it's uh it's just a lot i mean even you know just you know sometimes just taking attendance when 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 that has been policed more by certain certain administrations uh i mean it's just it's just yeah. which i've never wanted to do it's just you know like i gotta sit he's like you, you, it takes literally five to ten minutes of a 50 minute class to just read 50 names or 30 names to see who's here 
it's just, it's just so anyway, but, 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 uh, um, Anyway, but my point is, is just that, like, I like what the article is saying. There's, there's, there's just a general morale issue. I mm-hmm. think that that administrators would be would would do well to address in a meaningful way, not not in just some empty symbolism like we often get, you know. Yeah. So, now my my but wife, is, in, yeah, addition yeah. her, in addition to her her main job, my wife actually taught a couple classes. She was an adjunct at uh, Prince George's Community College. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, and she taught communications classes and speech, mm-hmm. like intro, like they would have speech 101 or something like that. And so, you know, I saw the, and that was just Tuesday, Thursday. So I just, and it was evenings. So, and these are mostly older students, obviously, but but I saw, I saw the workload she had just with that, with those two classes. And I was like, wow. So I can't imagine what you have for those four classes. Cause again, she had to read all of those, all of those papers. And I and I'll yeah. be on, I'll be honest at this particular point I actually helped her grade some of the papers because it was a, I wasn't supposed to but I, but she knew I could and so I would actually help her <laughs> I can say that now because you know she's going on but yeah you know anyway mm. but uh, uh, all right so let, one more quick break and then let's 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 do this week in crypto nonsense because uh, I got I actually got more than I thought I was going to have uh, really because it just keeps coming yeah 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 including a new report that that Bitcoiners might might want to might want to check out I don't know what research they do but we'll see real quick we're right back I mix what I, I mix, like what I, I like mix, what I, I mix, like what I like what I like what I like. All right, so back here at I mix what I like. There are just a, there's there's a number of quick things I want to get to, and then there's this this new report that that I, I want us to go through because I went through it and it was it was it was a bit of a challenge for me. So I I I, I don't want to just not get to it, but just a couple of pieces of news here um, that that I think is interesting. Uh, Coinbase brought you brought crypto to Main Street. Now Brian Armstrong wants to be your banker. Now, if folks remember Brian Armstrong, the, the CEO, uh, uh, head of Coinbase, which is the United States' number one exchange for, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, it it's pales in comparison. To, it's the Robin Hood of crypto, right? Well, it's, 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 well, no, I would, I think it is, it is, I think more like Robin Hood is like the, the, um, uh, man, I don't even know what the comparison would be. Robin Hood is like the, 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 the Kia to Coinbase's Porsche, <laughs> like Coinbase is just a bigger exchange right. and, but it, but it itself pales in comparison as we've talked about to the size of Binance which is the world's biggest exchange for for crypto. But even within that, if folks remember, Brian Armstrong just during the pandemic has made $550 million um, because of all the trading that has gone on as people have looked to find new ways. Um, And I don't know if this is intentional, but but the skinhead look doesn't, it doesn't, it it doesn't bring confidence for me as a never going to be investor, but but just you know, like but he got the gonna... he got the Steve Jobs look too, the black, you know, with the little gray. I angle. see, right, right, yeah. right, right, right. I think he's going more for Steve Jobs, but he's. I'm sure he is, like, but like some of us have been traumatized. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. But some of us been traumatized by our racialized experiences and and think of skinheads first, like one of them cats from, uh, the, from the military, from the army. Yeah, here's here's maybe here's a more here's a more jobs in look at him. Mm -hmm. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because the the point of this article, as as it says in the headline, is that he wants to be the new bank. And if you remember, if folks continue, remember, a lot of the promise of the Bitcoiners is the decentralization that circumvents banks and Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera. And as I keep trying to raise that there's, uh, there are others pointing out that there is a, a new form of concentration taking place. This seems to be going along those same lines. So when they get to this point in the article, as I've shown here, where it says, you know, where he's 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 um, wanting to take Coinbase public, even though they don't need to go public for money, um, he it says here because Armstrong says he wants to embrace regulators and the public markets to make Coinbase as transparent, even mundane as possible. Now, of course, he wants to go public and he wants to be. Uh, uh, submit himself to regulators because there's even bigger money in becoming the new bank. So as as I forgot, what's the guy, the guy's name who wrote the, the white guy wrote that book some years ago that had the the um, uh, an economist who wrote he, uh, Bill Black I think is his name uh, uh, who wrote the book the best way to rob a bank is to own one. 
uh, this is what I think they're headed towards. This is this is part of what I think, you know, even as I've been speculating, pun intended, they are this is this is the new form of the concentration is being attempted in this way. So if you're not going to go to Bank of America or Chase or JP Morgan, you'll have to go to Coinbase and it'll be more or less the same thing. You paying fees for them to house your your blockchain money or coin. Um, and you're paying fees to 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 transact, to send coins uh, as you would with a bank. Uh, and uh, yeah, and he makes more money and he becomes a central authority and blah, 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 blah. It's the same thing. So that was that's just one of the the quick ones I wanted to get to get to real quick. And I'll put I, I don't think I did yet, but I'll put the links to these um stories i'm doing getting to here in um in the show notes uh uh after you know after we wrap up um one other one here that just came uh my way i think this morning is uh let's see actually let me just let me i'm gonna leave that one i don't think that one is is i don't need to get to that one but this one somewhat related to not i'm going to come back to the specifics of bitcoin but uh or well specifics of bitcoin yeah but but this other story came up uh that that digital transformation could help black banks survive and not surrender so this is this is part of again the mythology that this blockchain and cryptocurrency or just the general move to 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 um uh digital currency and transactions is somehow going to do something to change the existing relationships social political economic whatever that currently exists so uh um the title the headline rather says that digital transformation could help black banks survive and not surrender but there's nothing here in the story that suggests how this is going to ha happen um so for instance so one problem with the story is of course the, this initial framing here in recent years george regulators floyd. i'm sorry say that again no i just say they, they they threw the george floyd thing in there for the emotional oh. impact you know right right yeah. well before i even got to that I'm, I'm just this first line here regulators have forced several black black owned banks to close or sell mm -hmm. that's not regulators forcing it it's 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 the failure of the banks themselves uh because primarily black people do not have enough money to put in those banks and as i've gone over repeatedly and despite whatever she's doing now marissa baradaran's chapter on this in her book is really really good because it breaks down specifically why black owned banks much like small white banks cannot grow and cannot produce wealth for their communities starting with their communities don't have any money to put in as deposits the banks lose money managing those deposits because the deposits are too small to create investable revenue uh, uh, or capital and and return through interest. Uh, and it costs more for the banks to pay people to work in those banks to service all the, the, the clients just to be tellers and whatnot than they make from the deposits of those the the, the uh, uh, customers. So, so that's then, just so, one so thing. Then, so then they have to charge higher interest rates and, and more penalties and things to make up, to try to make up for the To so try to make up. You know, then of course, which, which of course makes black people not want to the, the, with the little money we got say, well, I can't fight with the black bank because they always charge me penalties for this or that. You know, so yeah, this is. And then there's not enough. There's not enough potential in business or real estate for these banks to lend to black customers for mm -hmm. that lend, lending to come back with in time and with the proper interest uh, or at all, uh, because everything that black people do is devalued just off the break by them being black never mind any other detail <laughs> about mm -hmm. the economics of the whatever the blackness alone devalues everything so so there's it's just it's just like, i mean it's just another version of what malcolm used to say about you know you live in a poor community you get a poor education you get a poor job you you and and the, and the cycle continues and, and there's no it's just the same thing with that so then to your point yes some surviving banks have disclosed that recently as november they still needed more money to stay open even after the nation's largest banks invested hundreds of millions of dollars after george floyd's murder uh anyway the, the story just goes on that 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 you know um you know people are hoping black owned bank 
bankers are hoping that uh, the digitization of the process will help people move money faster and do things better and easier. Uh, but there's nothing in here that really suggests how this would work or that how, you know, so it's just another, I, I don't know, it's just another one of these empty claims about um, the potential of somehow a new technological form to do what only uh, public policy and political power can do. Um, right. All right. So with that, uh, so got those out. So then with that came this new, this new story that, that led me down another, uh, rabbit hole. Ex crypto backer, uh, says Bitcoin is a contagious disease and it's about to get nasty. Uh, and the short of it is, and then I'm going to show you the report itself. Uh, in a series of tweets this week, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, NYU risk engineering professor and author of the 2007 book, The Black Swan, which apparently has been said to be one of the best books of all time or whatever, uh, called Bitcoin a contagious disease built on, a, on bringing in suckers to build up a fragile speculative bubble that's now set to burst. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine that. Uh, Imagine that. Before last summer, the author was a Bitcoin believer. In 2017, Taleb went on so went so went so far as to write the forward to the Bitcoin Standard, written by fellow Lebanese countryman and economist Safid, Safedin Amous. In the book, both Taleb and Amous championed the cryptocurrency as a way out of repeated financial crises caused by traditional banking. But uh, and did I highlight anything from here? No. So what I did was. What I did was is go get his actual paper, uh, which I will uh, pull up here now um, and put the link to in the show notes as well. Uh, but uh, simply put or quickly put or firstly put, let me just pull up my version here so I can read the daggone thing. But I've, oh, I messed up. There was one more funny thing I forgot to get to in the academic part. Tag. I have to come back to that. OK, um, so one more little morsel for everybody to hold on to. Anyway. <laughs> um, all right. So this I, I, I want to share the paper and hopefully people can can see at least some of it here and maybe at some point i'm happy to hear uh uh Kaba, what you think and others to me it gets a little bit complicated but uh is is very uh, very interesting what what the, the claims are because essentially what he's saying is bitcoin is definitely going to go to zero and it's it just can't um he's saying that this this he, he he he's saying it's on its way. He's like it's it's over. Forget about. But this it. is what he this said is, before he said what he said. No, this is what he's saying after he said. No, initially he said do it. Like Bitcoin okay. is great, but okay. this is his latest report. Oh, his latest. I thought you were going uh, back and, to the one he did. The one you you just. No, no, no. I'm coming to the new okay. one. I'm okay. coming to the All new right, one cool. because because this is where he's saying it's a wrap, and this is from so, a, a piece of some forthcoming work. Apparently, Bitcoin currencies and fragility is the title from the forthcoming quantitative finance uh, journal, apparently. Mm. Th this discussion applies quantitative finance methods and economic arguments to cryptocurrencies in general and Bitcoin in particular, as there are about 10,000 cryptocurrencies we focus unless otherwise specified yeah. on the most discussed crypto uh, of those that claim to hew to the original protocol and the one with by far the largest market capitalization, which is of course, Bitcoin. In its current version, in spite of the hype, Bitcoin failed to satisfy the notion of currency without government. It proved to not even be a currency at all, can, can be neither a short nor long-term store of value, its expected value is no higher than zero, cannot operate as a reliable inflation hedge, and worst of all, does not constitute not even remotely a safe haven for one's investments, a shield against government tyranny, or a tail protection vehicle for catastrophic episodes. So in other words, every single thing that Bitcoin promoters and crypto cryptogandists promote, according to Nassim Nicholas Taleb, is just wrong. It's just not going to happen. Just cannot happen. All right. Uh, and he explains why. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm requesting as much help as we can get in assessing it. 
Uh, but the short of it is, uh, as he writes, this hardwired attribute, he goes into the history of blockchain and how Bitcoin uses it. But then he says this hardwired attribute in absence of supervision of the blockchain, that is its anonymity, its, its supposed anonymity, at least, um, this absence of supervision of the blockchain allow the storage of activities on a public ledger to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer commerce, transactions and settlements. The blockchain concept also allows for serial record keeping. This is supposed to help create what the original white paper described as a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of, of electronic cash um, would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. So one, remember this, going back to the story we just covered, they're saying this is part of the, this is the, the going back to the original white paper cited here, which I also have read, it's the same, you know, quoted here accurately, that that's the promise that they're going to get a peer to peer, uh, uh, you know, in, encrypted, private, decentralized exchange is going to make the world better. But we're already seeing uh, with that, even that last story I just went through that that the uh, exchanges. And I've, as I've also argued elsewhere, the technology that allows access to all of these places, blockchain mm -hmm. included, are all concentrated and consolidated in their ownership. Uh, never mind, as we're going to get to a little bit here, consolidation in terms of who, again, as I keep I've showed before, who owns and has access to all of this. All right. Uh, the Bitcoin transactional currency or BTC system establishes an adversarial collaboration between the so-called miners who validate transactions by getting them on a public ledger. As a reward, they get coins plus a fee from the underlying transactions, transfers of coins between parties. So as I've showed, I think last week, this is again why, uh, you know, access to mining is already a, a consolidated venture. I think they said 50 miners already do 50% of all the crypto mining. Uh, it's cost, you know, it's cost prohibitive to get all the computing technology you need, the electricity, so on and so on and so on and so on. But your rewards are this, this public ledger thing here. Um, oh, wait, let me. Wait, is this? No, that's not where I am. Or is it? I don't know if you're seeing exactly. I think you are, maybe. Miners, it says here, derive their compensation from both uh, signerage, the market think, value. I don't think I'm seeing the same thing you got. All right, so why? All right, why is that though? I see, I see the previous that? page. So that is, I'm on the page with comment one. So that's not that. Yeah, we're on the same page here. Okay, comment one. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. So on down okay, I here. Okay. Where, okay I, where it starts. You didn't highlight, you didn't highlight starts, what you're reading. You know what? I highlighted it after I put that okay. up. So it's okay, highlighted yeah. on mine. My bad. So, so yeah, starting where miners derive their compensation from signerage, the market value of Bitcoin minus the mining costs and transaction fees upon validation with the plan to switch to transaction fees as the sole revenues upon the eventual depletion of coins, which are limited to a fixed number. Mm -hmm. So remember, 21 million only will be mined. 3 million are already said to be lost, meaning 18 million are left. Mm -hmm. Eventually, this is going to be all mined up, and then they're going to move to transaction fees as the sole revenue of the eventual depletion of coins. And that's important for his argument in particular, because he's eventually going to be asking, well, what is the value? How can this become a, a, a permanent currency or value if it's dependent upon miners to sort of willfully do this um, for whatever fee compensation? Mm -hmm. Anyway, as he continues, a central attribute is that Bitcoin depends on the existence of such miners for per perpetuity. So he's saying that miners will always be needed even after everything is mined mm -hmm. and, and even because they will only be able because they'll still be needed to validate the transaction fees and the coins or whatever and they get paid you know anyway so now reggie middleton in our debate said i didn't know what i was talking about when i made the point said the made made the argument that capitalism itself is a zero-sum game but so i thought it was funny here that at the end of this this page he says that finally note that bitcoins are a zero sum by virtue of the numerous clauses. 
Now, I had to look up numerous clauses. I don't know if you knew what that is. I did not know what that was. I thought it was numerous... a, whole bunch of, a whole bunch of Santa Clauses is what I thought. <laughs> That's what I... It was a whole bunch of Santas. A fixed number of entrants admissible to an academic institution. So his Say point again. is that a fixed, a, number. Fixed, a fixed number of of entrants admissible to an academic institution. Hmm. So his point is that there's a fixed number. The fact that there are a fixed number of Bitcoins means that it's a zero sum game just because like either market. you have them or you don't. <laughs> just, like the, just like the stock market. There's only it's like musical chairs. There's only like so that. few seats. Somebody's not going to have a seat. And that's mm -hmm. why. So. So. OK. So then in comment one, he asks, why is Bitcoin or or, or Bit, BTC, which is what, what is it again? Bitcoin transaction currency, mm -hmm. transactional currency. Why is why BT is why Bitcoin is worth exactly zero? Gold and other pernicious metals are largely maintenance free, do not degrade over a historical horizon and do not require maintenance to refresh their physical properties over time. Cryptocurrencies require a sustained amount of interest in them. So that's what I thought. This is very interesting because this is all this is what we're, we're, we're always being told. We're, the the dollar is going to devalue. No, we're not using gold on this standard anymore. Blah, 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 blah. So we're, we're not we're not going to use anything that actually was assigned some value. We're just going to use something that we just made up that doesn't have anything. Well, yeah. And that's his point here. Put mm -hmm. put differently. That's his point here. A central result. Under the vulnerability of revenue-free bubbles, a central result, even principle, in the in the rational expectations and security pricing literature. So this is this to me was really fascinating. Check out what he says here. This is this is this is. I don't even know if this is right because I haven't done the literature review, but I thought this was fascinating. A central result, even principle, in the rational expectations and security pricing literature is that, thanks to the law of iterated expectations. If we expect now that we will that we will expect the price to vary at some point in the future, then by backward induction, such a variation must be incorporated in the price now. When there are no dividends, as with growth companies, there is still an expectation of future earnings and a future expect, expected reward to stockholders directly via dividends or indirectly via reverse dilutions and buybacks. It remains that a stock is a claim on accumulated assets and their residual value. But, what, that me editorializing there, earnings free assets with no residual value are problematic. The implication is that owing to the absence of any explicit yield benefiting to the hold, benefiting the holder of Bitcoin, if we expect that at any point in the future the value will be zero when miners are extinct, the technology becomes obsolete, or future generations get into other assets and Bitcoin loses its appeal for them, then the value must be zero now. The way I'm breaking it down in my own head is he's saying, based on how these these expectations, these rational expectations and iterated and iterated expectations work, if it can be expected in the future that Bitcoin will hit zero, then it has to be understood that its value now is zero. Very similar to that's, the stock market, because I mean that, that that that's what really speculation is all about. You you you're speculating what's going to happen in the future, so you're doing now. To kind of get ready for what's going to happen in the future. I mean, it's it's really so, the same thing, except that so, it's not regulated. <laughs> the stock so, market is supposed to be regulated, but it ain't really regulated. You know, it ain't really regulated. So, so if because remember, as Bitcoin and crypto gandists argue, crypto in those three stages of the history of money. It goes from being something that, you know, some, something that people think is interesting and they want to collect. Then it has a store of value when it's once people see that they can trade it for something else. And then it becomes a currency. And that that um, one thing that will that they argue is supposed to make Bitcoin better than gold is that it never runs out. Or rather, it is it is it is. I'm sorry, it it it. it, it Right. It's not required. It, you know, it's not required or, or tied to something in the natural universe. It can be halved 
as you would gold. So you can constantly create, take a, you know, take a, a, a one Bitcoin and cut it down to a whole million, millions of Satoshis. Uh, um, and therefore, because the, the dollar is already off the gold standard, Bitcoin can replace the dollar and not need to be on the gold standard and be better than gold. So then he goes on to, to say here that the typical comparison of Bitcoin to gold is lacking in elementary financial rigor, which he goes on to explain in part this way. Path dependence is a problem. We cannot expect a book entry on a ledger that requires active maintenance by interested and incentivized people to keep its physical presence a condition for monetary value for any period of time. And of course, we are not sure of the interest mindsets and preferences of future generations. So unlike gold, he's saying for, for Bitcoin to maintain its value going forward, we have to, we have to count on the mining community to keep up with the tracking of the ledger, uh, uh, the accuracy of the ledger, uh, um, uh, and to make sure that the ledger continues to exist. If they if they walk away, if if everybody walks away, then the ledger you know I guess doesn't disappear, but access to it or reading it or knowing what's what, verifying it disappears. So then he continues. See that? Once see that, that, that yeah, just real quick. But see when you when you when you can when you can just create money out of nothing without any kind of you know real value then that's gonna that's that's what you call inflation at a, at a certain point because you can't you can't just keep printing money without any consequences and i think like after last year when we look at what they did last year where they they do print up like 10 trillion dollars or something like that and gave it to these folks and to, to the people in the top you know one half mm -hmm. or one percent or whatever now we're seeing inflation now, you just you started off talking about gas, you know, right. because, you know, they, they got the money, so they don't necessarily need the workers per se. So, I mean, for various reasons, people are not working now. People are opting to, like, just not work because it's not even worth it. Like, they're not making enough money to to even live to work. It, it costs them more to get to the job. It costs them more to do child care, you know, and now you add to the, and it was already terrible, but now you infuse this whole inflation piece to it. I mean, what are people going to do? So, so it sounds like this is the same exact thing that's happening, that's that that's going to happen that they're predicting to happen in the crypto world. That's actually happening with the you know the dollar. I mean, one of my interests here is that because again, I don't pretend to understand every single thing here, and I've really struggled with this piece in particular. But but what what I'm also fascinated by is that the more I pay attention to the discussion, particularly in black spaces around crypto, none of this research is being considered. And the published research that I'm reading is is goes nowhere in 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 making uh, what I would see as an honest uh, economic or otherwise assessment of the situation. They're all again, I keep saying crypto gandas because they're just pushing something. It just feels like they're pushing something for their own benefit, uh, and, and then again, and then wrapping it in this 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 liberation language. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I'm putting this out, you know, again, I'm, we'll share all these links and if anybody can correct me, if I'm, if this guy is wrong, send me the work, whatever. But, uh, uh, I would like to see, you know, anyway, at, at just a little bit more here. Once, once Bitcoin drops below a certain threshold, it may hit an absorbing barrier and stay at zero. Gold, on the other hand, is not path dependent in its physical properties as discussed in te uh, in seven, technologies tend to be supplanted by other technologies. 99% of the new is replaced by something newer, whereas items such as gold and silver have proved resistant to extinction. But he's saying that that's not something that you could be expected for Bitcoin uh, or for what comes next on the blockchain. So Principle one, cumulative ruin. If any non -divid if any non-dividend yielding asset has the tiniest constant probability of hitting an absorbing barrier, causing its value to become zero, then its present value must be zero. So the same kind of thing, like according to the principle of cumulative ruin, if something, if if, if a non-dividend yielding asset and, and apparently Bitcoin and crypto are non-dividend yielding assets, then the tiniest probability of, of its absorption barrier, uh, of hitting an absorption barrier, 
causing its value become then it, causing it to be valued as zero, then its present value must be seen as zero. Anyway, so um, continue under success in the wrong places. More generally, the fundamental flaw and contradiction at the base of most cryptocurrencies is, as we saw, that the originators, miners, and maintainers of the system currently make their money from the inflation of their currencies <laughs> rather than just from the volume of underlying transactions in them. Hence, the total failure of Bitcoin to become a currency has been masked by the inflation of the currency value, generating paper profits for a large enough number of people to enter the discourse well ahead of its utility. So again, as I'm reading that, it's this, it's saying bubble, if you got in early and can convince other people to come in, it inflates the value and you can get out, turn it in for paper, turn it in because it's still valued in the US dollar. And then you can cash out and make your money. And that's why uh, it's getting all this discussion, it, as he says here, um, well ahead of its uh, ahead of its utility. And like the real, the true capitalists who have control over the real natural resources and sway over the real natural resources, they said earlier in this piece that the true wealth in this whole Bitcoin piece is those who are miners. And those right. are very few people. There's not many, many people. Uh, and, and it's a, a, interesting, though, that they call it miners, like, right, like mining mm -hmm. for natural resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting. It's the same thing. Like they, they it, you're the, the ones who are holding the Bitcoin, so to speak, will be left holding the bag, just like those who hold the dollar in just that alone and not necessarily are are in that core group that already gets that, you know, that 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 initial um investment you know uh value it's it's the same it's pretty much the same principle at play you know that we're seeing now so everybody so everybody's rushing to get all these bitcoins are going to uh, cause an inflation you know again with that which is only going to benefit those who are the miners those who are the the real power players in the whole in the whole process now here of course in this context inflation means inflating the value as opposed to inflation which in 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 the more oh okay i see you know, it, it, like he's not talking about inflation where you create more and it devalues what's in circulation. He's saying okay. here that it inflates the value of the coin uh, um, because, as he says here in comment two, the success for a digital currency uh, is, is mistaken. He says there is mistaken conflation between success for a digital currency, which requires some stability and usability and speculative and speculative price appreciation. So he's talking about the speculative price appreciation part. That's the inflation he's talking about. Um, and people are saying, and that's why he's saying people are confusing the success of Bitcoin as a digital currency with the fact that its speculative price has gone up. Mm -hmm. uh, but its speculative price has only gone up because uh, um, more people are investing in it. Uh, which helps uh, all of the people who are in the primary, form. which which helps the initial value of the stock. Yeah. But then, mm -hmm. as it, but then it fluctuates, it goes down. It's you know it's all over the place. Um, it's not stable. Uh, so as he says here under comment three and payment system, there is a conflation between accepting Bitcoin for payments and pricing goods in Bitcoin. The price in Bitcoin, Bitcoin, the price must be to price in Bitcoin. Bitcoin, the price must be fixed with a conversion into fiat floating rather than the reverse. So, I mean, I thought this was interesting, too, because, uh, again, I think he makes a good point that I do not see being even discussed in, in particularly black conversations around this issue. So he's saying, you know, just because you see people in some places saying, hey, we're now accepting Bitcoin you know, for payments, that does not mean it, that that goods are being priced in Bitcoin. They're still being priced. Again, that's the question the I dollar. keep asking about the, the being based on the value of the dollar. Yeah, right. So, so what are we really talking about here? So, in the on the next sort of uh, column, and in uh, fact, people then, people take the big. A lot of times, people will cash, quote unquote, literally cash out with the Bitcoin. Exactly, and get, and actually get dollars because that's because most people that I know when when you really listen to them talking about it. Ultimately, that's what they want to do. They ultimately want to get the money. They ultimately want to get the cash, the dollar. You know, they, they're investing in this to get the money back. In exactly. Terms cash, in terms of the dollar value, not necessarily in this whole world. So in, even in that, you're still not being breaking. You're still not breaking away. You're still not being revolutionary. Even if you're just looking at it on that level, it's not revolutionary. 
So he's because he says here, the only items that currently appear to be somewhat priced in Bitcoin are other cryptocurrencies. And even then, not always. Bimetallism did not last long because he goes through a, a little bit of a history between. I mean, there's a lot more detail here, but he goes through some of the history of what is called bimetallism or when people have multiple currencies in, in, in going at one time. And he says that bimetallism did not last long, nor could commodities last as currencies in developed economies. So multiple currencies don't last and certainly for the for the for the main business of the day they don't last uh and commodities don't work well as currencies uh in developed economies which is which is probably why well which is why he's definitely arguing bitcoin isn't going to you know isn't going to work as a as a currency because it's a commodity and that's how it's existing in in the in the market uh, uh primarily uh but I, you know anyway uh, anyway, in 2021, the government's central and local share of GDP in Western economies is around 30 to 60 percent, one order of magnitude higher than it was in the 1900s. Government employees and contractors get paid in fiat currencies. Taxes are collected similarly in, in that is in fiat currencies. Um, I looked it up right now. Uh, the United States is about 40 percent of share of its GDP is. Uh, um, you know, um, run by the, the, the federal government. Uh, so it fits right within this, this, and the point being that, um, I think at least as I understand it, well, just the, the previous paragraph, more generally, the reasons multiple currencies exist in the absence of pegs is because there is not enough gl globalization and markets are not entirely free between currency zones. Uh, and some goods and services such as haircuts and auto repair cannot be traded internationally. They are not, to use the language of quantitative finance, arbitra arbitrageable. So uh, in 2021, the government's central and local share, uh, the government's share of GDP in Western economies is around 30 to 60 percent, one order magnitude higher than it was in the 1900s. Government employees and contractors get paid in fiat currency. Taxes are collected similarly. So as I understand it, or think I understand it, what they're saying is that, it, again, it would require government back or government backing to adopt or public policy or political power to adopt currency for use because so much of uh, um, uh, any country's GDP is wrapped up in what the government is infusing into the economy. And if the government is using the dollar in this case, then trying to get paid as, as some rappers and athletes are starting to say now in Bitcoin is, is going to limit the value both of the currency or the, the Bitcoin itself, but of, of its overall, you know, right. It's going to limit its value because what, it, what, how much can it do in the economy if this much of it is taken up by the federal government that uses the fiat currency? Anyway, that's, again, I'm very happy to be checked on any of this. I do not claim to, to have a, 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 a tremendous grasp of this. But I just don't think any of this is being considered in particularly black spaces, but even anywhere that I'm seeing in a lot of this popular conversation. So just a little bit more here uh, on this next page in the on the in the right hand column in the parable of Christ in the temple. Jesus kicked the money changers out of the temple of Jerusalem. Now. Now, one wonders why there were money changers in a place of worship. The answer is that the temple took for currency only the shekel of Tyre, known for its 90 percent silver content and its ancestral quality control. Simply, there is a free market for fiat currencies with the most reliable at the time used by third parties. But long long term contracts. Uh, actually, I forgot. Why did I why did he say this story and why did I highlight it? Excuse me. So I, 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 can't, just, I can't even see which one you highlighted. So, oh my bad. Yeah, yeah. It's it's over on the right hand side under the uh, right the first full paragraph under page five there okay. in the parable okay. of Christ. Okay, I see. Uh, and, and why he, why was he talking about that? Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry because I skipped the other the difficulty of inflation. Okay, this does not mean that cryptocurrency cannot displace fiat. It is indeed desirable to have at least one real currency without a government. 
but the new currency just needs to be more appealing as a store of value by tracking a weighted basket of goods and services with minimum error. Displacing fiat is not easy and has been done locally, though no single item has proved to be more permanent and difficult, uh, and the difficulty is best re represented in the following example. During the 1970s, the Italian national telephone tokens, the Gettoni, were considerable, considered acceptable tender, almost always accepted as payment. The price of the, of the espresso when it's expressed in lira varied over time, but it remained sticky to the Gettone. For a while, the Gettone or Gettoni proved the closest money to track the Fisher index across 12 communes. And while the Gettoni worked for daily purchases such as espresso, it, it's doubtful that they could have used uh, a payment for use it, it, it is doubtful they could have been used as payment for an Alfa Romeo. I don't even know what that is. What what is that? What's an Alfa Romeo? It's a car. It's a fancy sports car. Oh, that's why I don't know. Uh, or or it was. It it's was. Much, it's too much money for me to even know what it was. I'd heard it before, but I never did check into it. All right. Anyway, let me. I I don't know what I was getting at there. I don't. I don't. I don't understand what what, what was being said there about the parable of of the 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 Christ in the temple. Uh, so I have to come back to that. But but. But under the, the next part, under some additional fallacies, the fallacy of libertarianism, and this is actually, is that you? Yeah, that was me. Sorry about that. Okay, my bad. Okay. Um, this is actually what I think is um, part of the major problem, particularly when this is brought into Black and other spaces where liberation is the, is claiming to be the discussion, because... I, I think as, as, as the author puts here, there's a fallacy under, underneath it is this fallacy of, of something political that can't be. And as he puts it here, there's a fallacy of libertarianism. The belief that Bitcoin is an offshoot of, of libertarian and Austrian economics has no solid backing. It is the same lack of rigor as one, of the behind, as one behind the belief that cryptos represent a hedge for inflation. Spitznagel has already in 2017 debunked the notion that Bitcoin can be a safe haven as discussed next, or that the principles of Austrian economics can be invoked in support of cryptocurrencies. So like when, when people keep making reference to people like Max Kaiser and others, I think, I actually think, you know, he tends towards that libertarianism. And I want to say, I've heard him say that he's a, he's a believer in Austrian economics, um, which I'm no expert in, but is is um, uh, certainly no revolutionary left uh, economic analysis. But the point, anyway, as he says here, um, libertarianism is about the rule of law in place of the rule of regulation. It is not about the rule of rules. Libertarianism is fundamentally about the rule of law in place of the rule of regulation. It is not about the rule of rules, mechanistic automated rules with irreversible outcomes. The real world is fraught with ambiguities and even Napoleonic law, far less me mechanistic than crypto rules, cannot keep up to wit, to wit a as a risk man management directive, most commercial contracts traditionally prefer for forms of dispute resolution to be done, to be under more flexible Anglo-Saxon common law. Anyway, nor is libertarianism about total distrust. And of course, blockchain, as they get into, is about total distrust. By its very nature, Bitcoin is open for all to see. The belief in one's ability to hide one's assets from uh, the government with a public blockchain, easily triangularizable, triangularizable at endpoints, oh, and not just... Now, that's a tough word right that's there. Good, about 15 syllables. Triangularizable at endpoints, and not just <laughs> read by the FBI, but also by people in their living rooms, requires a certain lack of financial seasoning and statistical understanding, perhaps even a lack of minimal common sense. So, in other words, he, he I, I skipped over some part of this, but he he goes he talks about how underlying the philosophy underlying uh, cryptocurrency and and even the blockchain is uh, total distrust. Nobody, you know that 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 you. You know, you the, it's the only way you can verify that someone will do something via a smart contract or it's the, the only way that you can get around, a, a, you know, a, a, a world that cannot be trusted. Banks can't be trusted. Speculate. I mean, regulators can't be trusted. Thieves can't be trusted. Um, but then, as he points out here, 
Bitcoin is open for all to see. The belief in one's ability to hide one's assets from the government with a public blockchain, easily triangularizable at endpoints, and not just read by the FBI, but also by people in the living rooms, requires a certain lack of financial seasoning and statistical understanding, perhaps even a minimal lack of, of minimal common sense. For instance, Wolfram Research Specialist was a... Uh, a Wolfram research specialist was able to statistically detect and triangularize anonymous ransom payments by the Colonial pot Pipeline on May 8th in 2021, and it did not take long for the FBI to restore the funds. So his point, and I had forgotten about this, maybe you and others will remember that when the Colonial Pipeline thing was hacked, it didn't take long for, for the FBI, just as you said, to find the people who hacked it, it for the funds to be restored, um, we've already covered how the CIA is is saying in their own research, or at least what they've made public in their own research, their claims is that, hey, Bitcoin and, and this blockchain thing is great for surveillance. Th this this notion that it's all secretive is, is, is I don't know what they're talking, you know, it's like, but that's, again, one of the biggest claims of the crypto gandis is that it's all secret, it's private, you don't have to you don't have to worry about not trusting anybody because everything is on the ledger and it's protected and anonymous and pseudonymous and so on and so on and so on. Um, so the, as he says here, the slogan escape government tyranny, hence Bitcoin, is similar to advertisements in the 1960s extol extolling the health benefits of cigarettes. I love that line. It, and it fits right in with where I am more comfortable uh, uh, you know, academically, intellectually, et cetera, within the world of PR and advertisement. The slogan is Eddie Bernays, thanks to our good friend Eddie Bernays. He came up with that whole thing saying that, that cigarettes were actually healthy, were healthy. He said that ham and eggs were with all of that grease and fat. He said that that was he, he was helped, he helped to shape that whole narrative around that stuff. Being absolutely healthy. remember because yeah. he said women get women get your freedom by getting your, freedom, your phalluses. Freedom Freedom torches. Freedom torches. Mm -hmm. you get your own personal phallus that you can, yeah. you can manipulate. And and made um, it a part and made it a part of the quote unquote woke, you know, uh trend of that day. You know, something that was legit women's rights and rights and suffrage. They, they they tied all that into it to to kind of, you know, he took he took a hold of the zeitgeist and and ran with it and used it for the corporations in terms of the tobacco and the uh, tobacco industry. And any every day I see on Twitter now, like the algorithm has reshaped itself for you know for me now. Where I so I see all of these these. I mean, I see just all this crypto ganda. It's just mm -hmm. escape government, hence Bitcoin. It's, you know, like black and brown um, using again using that that's old it. language. Yeah. So as he says here, under the fallacy of agency problem, one might have the impression that by being distributed, Bitcoin would be democratic and reduce the agency problem perceived to be present among civil servants and bankers. Unfortunately, there appears to be a worse agency problem, a concentration of insiders hoarding what they think will be the world currency. So others would have to go to them later on for the supply. They would be cumulatively earning trillions with many billionaire hodlers in comparison, the evil civil servants behind fiat money make, at best, lower middle class wages. This situation represents a wealth transfer to the cartel of early Bitcoin accumulators. Few assets in financial history have been more fragile than Bitcoin. No, there is no evidence that we are getting, uh, getting a great technology unless great technology doesn't mean useful. And at the time of writing, in spite of all the fanfare, we have, we have done still close to nothing with the blockchain. So we will close with a Damascus joke. One vendor was selling the exact same variety of cucumbers at two different prices. Why is the one one twice the price? The merchant was asked. They came on a higher they came on higher quality mules was the answer. We only judge a technology by how it solves problems, not by what technological attributes it has. I actually like that point too. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know. I, Again, I don't claim to fully understand everything in this piece. I don't claim that I, you know, so therefore I, you know, but it just, it does comport with my general approach and argument, uh, particularly this advertising piece. Uh, it does seem to make sense. It does seem to answer some of the questions that I've had about how is this thing going to maintain and, you know, sustain value and become a currency. Uh, and, um, uh, and he's even, but, but unlike, he's even gone beyond where I've gone. Because I'm, I, I was just saying, look, cryptocurrency isn't legit as a as a liberate liberating tool, but you know the blockchain technology seems interesting and may do something. He's saying we haven't even done anything with that. 
Uh, and therefore, even that can't be, you know, seen as as having much value because there's no no it doesn't, as he says, um, uh, it hasn't proved itself useful. And ultimately, and then I'll stop here. If the goal for as it is for me is redistribution and and some sort of revolution, then it's definitely not useful because it's not doing that. It's just increasing the concentration. So anyway, that's it for me, man. Any 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 thoughts, concluding thoughts on that or anything else? Any any no, I mean that was that, that was a lot. I'm gonna have to check them links out and 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 study it and read it about 15 times myself to or to really try to let it sink yeah. in. You know, but yeah, it's, that, that it's, it's definitely good information though. Uh for I think everybody to try, try as challenging, you know, try on as, as challenging as it is, because it's a very important piece, you know, particularly around the all of this discussion around crypto, people talking about it. So it's good to have some kind of intelligent, you know, inside type of information from somebody who actually understands this stuff. Like really, I would like, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I would like to. To I, I mean, I'd be in, very interested in, in responses. So I'll end on this one because I saw this. This is part of the crypto gander that I think is funny. Uh, this tweet here: VC venture capitalist investment in cryptocurrency and blockchain companies in 2012, 100 million, and 2021, 30 billion. So as I said here, it looks like just like a stairway to liberation. A few more VCs, and that inequality divide will soon be closed. Um, and that's why they see, cause they're hoarding up the, what they think will be the currency of the future. And, uh, if, if they've already put 30 billion in just last year, how the hell are we going to catch up? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my man, thank you very much, man. Shout out to you. Shout out to Jackie Lukeman. Shout out to brother Josh hanging out in the back, helping us out. Big shout out to all the remixers, to those who see this now, who see this later. Thank you very much. Please like, share, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend. As the ear doctor says, check out all the good stuff coming later on the platform today. Jackie Luke Mon, burn it down with Kim Brown on her platform. Bunch of stuff coming up over the weekend, including Sundays. And I'll be back Monday with more I Mix What I Like. And Kaba will be back Monday with his radio program on WPFW. Dot yeah, thank, O-R-G. You, thank you for uh, coming on the show on Monday, man. That was great. We had a great discussion around Dr. King, the radical Dr. King. The, the radical Dr. King. And I got to go back, man. I, I didn't get a chance as I could, I got called away, but I got to go back and hear, man, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ampum. Yes. Yeah, he was on. Uh, who you had on as well, because I know his, his stuff is sharp. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah we, anyway, didn't, so. we didn't even get into his Nubia stuff or his his debunking of the uh, the Willie Lynch letter. Or maybe we have to do that the next time he comes on. Yeah, and I'm 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 glad he's doing that too because that thing is still people still believe that thing. They still so, believe. Yeah. It. yeah. So even if it's not true, it, da, 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 it's like, right, 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 right. But true. but let's focus on the not true part. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Like Fred said, peace if you because I know you're willing to fight for it. Thanks again, brother Cobb. Bye. See you Thank all you. later. Catch you in the whirlwind. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like.